What we're going to talk about today is how to identify common production drive mechanisms. This is a this is a really important subject in my mind. Um, it's one of those exercises that has a tremendous amount of value for a very short investment of time. We're not going to be doing any complicated mathematics or graphing or modeling. It's really just qualitative interpretation using uh, readily available production data, rates and pressures. Uh, why is it so important to be able to identify production drive mechanisms? Well, once you understand the production drive mechanism in a given area or basin or sub-basin, uh, you'll be a lot better, uh, you'll have a lot less uncertainty and be a lot more reliable with your production forecasting. And obviously that has a huge amount of value. If you don't understand the production drive mechanisms, there's a lot of uncertainty. So uh, making good decisions about uh, reserve allotment, um, drilling new wells, field development, things like that are going to be a lot more difficult if you don't understand those production drive mechanisms. What I've tried to do here is make a list of what I think are some of the more common production drive mechanisms. For most of the past 10 to 15 years, I've really been focused very much on um, uh, horizontal multi-frac wells, which are really transitional flow and transient flow. But I've widened this list to include a lot more conventional applications as well. So really this list would apply to almost any reservoir anywhere in the world. And so what we wanna do is get our hands on some rate and pressure data, uh, use some of these basic diagnostic tools that I'm gonna be talking about, uh, the log log plot with pressure normalized rate versus material balance time. This is an easy thing to plot just in Excel, very, very simple. Um, you need to get your hands on a model type curve that represents the, the data. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and then we'll do a little bit with fluid ratios as well. So let's take a look. Okay, so the log log plot and the type curve, and I'm going to do this all with whiteboarding, I'm not going to use any software examples, uh, just to sort of illustrate the concept. Um, the log log plot is really the bread and butter of uh, well performance uh, engineering. And we'll see this plot used all the time in production analysis and, and rate transient analysis. So what we're going to do is Q over delta P, and the delta P is PI minus PWF, so it's the flowing pressure drop. And then on the x-axis we plot TC which is material balance time. Material balance time if we're looking at oil is going to be cumulative oil divided by rate. This is very easy to do like I said in, in just an Excel. Now what you need to do here is the critical step. You need to have a representative type curve model. Uh, I'm going to use for the for the purposes of this demonstration uh, our standard good old bounded linear flow model. This was made popular by Wattenberger in the late 1990s. And this is a really nice, simple model that represents formation linear flow into a fracture. It can represent a vertical fracture uh, in a vertical well or a series of uh, vertical uh, fractures intersecting a horizontal well. Uh, the type curve for this model looks like this. Very, very straightforward. We have a half slope at the beginning and then it transitions into a unit slope. Um, let me spend a minute talking about the log log plot. Why is the log log plot important? Uh, the log log plot is really a visual tool that helps us do pattern recognition with production data analysis. The logarithmic scale gives us the ability to uh, stretch out the early time. Um, all the interesting things in production analysis, or I should say most of the interesting things in production data happen in the very, very early time. So if we plot production data on a linear scale, we don't get to see that stuff. It happens really quickly and it's in a small time slice. So one of the things a logarithmic plot does is it really evens out the scale and gives us a much more visual representation of what's going on. So that's the type curve. Um, another popular tool that we uh, can add to this is the derivative. So the derivative I'll, I'll put on here and I'll show it in a different color is going to look something like this. It will also have a half slope at the beginning and then it'll go into unit slope, but it's transition into that unit slope uh, happens more abruptly uh, the base function, which is Q over delta P, has a more gradual transition. Um, the derivative plot is useful because it really highlights uh, small changes in the reservoir signal. It's a derivative after all, so if there's a change in slope, you're going to see it very clearly. And it's defined as D, uh, sorry, let's say it's the inverse of D, uh, D log T, so it's a semi-log derivative of delta P over Q. Okay, so that's what we're plotting up, up there. Um, 
I have mixed feelings about this as a practical tool in general when we talk about production data analysis, uh, mostly because uh, it amplifies the re reservoir signal, but it also amplifies the noise. So if you have a lot of noise in your data, and this is particularly true for liquids rich cases where we don't have bottom wall gauge data, um, the derivative sometimes is too noisy to make any, any sense out of. Uh, but it's worth a try anyways when you're doing this sort of work. So, um, so basically that's your type curve. Um, just for the purposes of comparison, I'm going to include some other type curves on here that might be of interest. And we'll use another color here again, uh, purple this time. If you're working with more of a conventional reservoir application, uh, a, a model that we use quite a lot is this radial or cylindrical flow solution problem or model. And its type curve looks a little bit different. It has an upward concavity at the beginning and then transitions into our standard uh, boundary dominated flow. It's gonna look something like this. Um, these uh, stems that you see that I've drawn over here for this model are in indicative of the early or transient flow. Uh, and, and you'll tend to have different stems depending on how stimulated the, the well is. So this could represent a, a fractured well. This could actually be a fracture in which case the early uh, data will actually start to approach that bounded linear flow model, or it could be a, you know, an unstimulated well, in which case it will be more of these, uh, one of these stems going down here. So I include that just as a comparison um, to show that this diagnostic works just as well for conventional applications as it does for, you know, your unconventional bounded linear flow problem. You just need to start with the right type curve. Um, so that's really the tools of the trade that we're going to get started with. What I'm going to do now is get right into an example of how we can actually apply this and what uh, real production data will look like. So I'm going to draw, um, once again, let's go back to our red and uh, I'll put the scales on here like I did last time. This is TC and this is Q over delta P. I'm not going to bother showing the derivative here. We'll just uh, use the base data. So we've got our half slope shown up there and we've got our unit slope shown at the bottom. All right. Boundary dominant flow starts when basically when we have that unit slope. Uh, remember, this is a logarithmic plot. So data collected in this region of the plot takes a long time to acquire. To get, you know, to move from, from here down to here, that might be a year or two years. Uh, and, and the further you move to the right, <clears throat> the right, the more compressed that data gets. In other words, it takes longer and longer and longer to collect that data. To, so to see these boundary dominated flow signatures, you have to be patient and a lot of times you're doing a forensic analysis you're looking back in time because you're not going to see it as it's happening you're going to have to go back and look at an old well to really see these signatures and that's you know to get our um our, our sort of uh standard charts where we recognize these textbooks textbook signatures that's what we do we go back to old data wells that have been in production for 20 years or 30 years and we look at the signatures in a in a hindsight sort of uh, perspective all right, so that's boundary dominated flow starting from here. Um, the boundary dominated flow diagnostics are very simple. Uh, anything that's, let me change the color again. Uh, anything that is on this side of the curve, and I'll draw just sort of a, a, a triangular region that shows it. So if we have data in this area, this is gonna be indicative of pressure support. Why is pressure support important? Well, pressure support adds, pressure support in general is gonna be good for production. It's it's uh, essentially, if we want to define it a little more clearly, it is going to be some external energy source or internal energy source that comes into play beyond just volumetric depletion. And so if we start to see data, you know, coming out here, that's an indication that we have pressure support. By the way, if the data uh, stays right on that unit slope line, of course, that is our tank type. That's our classic tank type volumetric signature. So I'm going to, I don't want to forget about that. Let's write that here in red. So our unit slope is our standard volumetric depletion. So we can call it volumetric or tank type depletion. Uh, all other things being equal, most wells will behave this way because they're drilled in a reservoir. And once we see all the boundaries, we'll start depleting. And, and that's sort of our engineering 101. Uh, if we have pressure support, in other words, the data has a, has a slope or develops into a slope that's shallower than one, um, that could be indicative of a number of different things. And I listed some of them on the first slide. We could have pressure support due to gas cap if it's an oil well or solution gas drive. There could be an active water drive. There could be connected reservoirs. 
um, heterogeneities in the system where we've got a slow feed, a very, very low permeability oil or gas feeding into a high permeability fractured system. This is what we see in unconventionals quite a lot. So pressure support can be caused by a number of different phenomena. Uh, you have to uh, understand, you know, uh, uh, or have access to other information about the reservoir to really pinpoint what's going to cause that. Um, now let's look at the other side of the uh, uh, boundary dominated stem. Uh, in this region, if we have data falling down into this region, um, this is what I call a leaky reservoir. So we have pressure support on one side. Okay, and then we have volumetric tank depletion with an exact unit, unit slope, and then we have a leaky reservoir on the other side. If you really think about it, this makes sense, right? Our volumetric tank type flow, everything's all sort of sealed and secure. We're depleting just as we should. If, on the other hand, we have multiple um, straws in the milkshake, so to speak, uh, that's your leaky reservoir. So that's leaky reservoirs are almost always caused by interference. Uh, the only exception I can think to that rule is if you have a, uh, a partially sealing fault and lower pressure on the other side of that fault, that could also create a leaky reservoir response. Um, but all other things being equal, that leaky reservoir response is going to be uh, caused by interference. So you've got a really good example of this, which we see all the time in all kinds of basins from very, very tight, you know, unconventional applications all the way to sort of high permeability conventional gas fields uh, in the North Sea, for example. Um, is you have uh, uh, a well or wells that are already on stream and then you come in later and you drill infill wells or you drill offset development wells. These wells will be the second straw or the third straw in the milkshake and they will start moving or stealing reserves away, uh, production away from the original well and you will see that in the uh, response uh, as part of these boundary dominated flow diagnostics. So that's your boundary dominated flow. All right, let's talk about transient flow diagnostics. Um, as you might expect, the transient flow diagnostics are done on the other side, on the early side of the curve. So once again, I'll draw this plot. I'm getting better and better at drawing this every time I do it. And uh, again, we're using our, our simple bounded linear flow model, Q over delta P versus TC. And again, this is always, I forgot, forget to do it, but I wanna be um, uh, re-emphasize that we're always doing this on a log log coordinates. All right, so transient this time, we're looking at everything on this side in the early time. So really our baseline curve is half slope. And what does that half slope represent? Well, that half slope basically represents, uh, uh, essentially we want to call that like an infinite conductivity fracture, okay? Or system of fractures. So why would we say that's sort of the baseline? Would we, would, do we expect fractures to, to behave infinitely? We, know, we all know that fractures have a finite conductivity. So why are we using that as our, you know, our baseline type curve? Well, especially if you're dealing in ultra tight plays like shale oil and shale gas, uh, even finite conductivity fractures generally behave as if they're infinite acting. This is because there's such an enormous contrast between the matrix conductivity and the fracture conductivity. So this is actually a very good baseline. Most of these bounded linear flow systems behave like infinite conductivity during the initial production. So um, if on the other hand, we were looking at a reservoir that was more conventional and maybe we just had a frac pack or maybe a well that's not even fractured at all, uh, we certainly wouldn't use this as our baseline type curve. We'd use a type curve that was more of the conventional type that looks like this. Uh, so it's very, again, it's very important to pick the, choose the right baseline type curve and make sure that uh, we're using it to, you know, we're using the right tool for the right application. I'm going to go ahead and erase that, that one because we don't want to use that one there and go back to our bounded linear flow model. All right. So um, what are we specifically, what are we looking for for transient? Well, very, very simple. Um, similar to the boundary dominated flow, we could either see data that uh, goes above this line or we could see data that goes below this line. And with transient flow, these two things mean very, very different things, and they have very, very different sources of, of what controls them. Let's start with uh, let's start with the, one, the data falling below the line. Okay, uh, as you might expect, this suggests damage. So now you've got a fracture system that is not behaving like infinite conductivity; it's behaving like finite conductivity, and a lot of fractures will behave this way. So this could be uh, the source of this could be anything related to the you know low prop and conductivity itself all the way to fines migration, phase trapping, 
uh, you name it, could be stress-dependent permeability that's causing this. So uh, in a qualitative way, we can diagnose that by, by looking at um, uh, data dropping below the half slope. Uh, this is an area where it's actually really useful to plot the derivative because interestingly, the derivative will maintain its half slope. The derivative isn't going to show you this diagnostic, but the combination of the derivative plot with the normalized rate plot, and I, I won't sketch it here, but the combination of those two will show you that you still have your linear flow, but that you've got an increased damage effect with that linear flow. That's a dynamite combination. Uh, with just the Q over delta P on its own, you can't, it's a little fuzzier, you can't, you can't see it on its, uh, see it as well. So that's something to think about. Uh, what, ha what now happens if we see data above that line? Um, in theory, uh, you know, a model shouldn't be able to produce data that goes above that half slope line. Uh, but in practice, we see it all the time. And most commonly, uh, well, I'm going to divide it into really into two categories. Uh, assuming that our data is all correct, the most common explanation for the data coming above the line and sort of peeling up at the beginning is what we call this supercharge effect. Effect, okay. And why why do we get a supercharge effect? Well, supercharge effect or, or supercharge at the beginning. Uh, you have to remember we're we're pumping these massive hydraulic fracture treatments into these reservoirs. Uh, it takes, especially in low permeability, where you don't get a whole lot of leak off going on, or leak off is very very slow. Uh, you're, uh, you may actually be well into production before you even get fracture closure. So you've got this uh, um, uh, almost like the fractures are almost like balloons and they're, and they're swelled with, with extra pressure over and above reservoir pressure. Well, this is going to give you this, this effect of this data not conforming to the half slope as, as it should, you know, if we were in a normally pressured situation and all of that extra energy, that, that, that frac fluid pressure that you pumped in there had, had already bled off. So that's a good indication that that's what you're seeing there. Um, another thing that you can add to this to uh, uh, confirm this would be a, a, if it's an oil well, a water oil ratio. Okay, so a fluid ratio plotted in this same vicinity showing a decreasing uh, water oil ratio. In other words, you haven't recovered all that load fluid yet is a good indicator that, that you know, we're seeing that supercharge effect. So those are your, our transient flow uh, diagnostics. Uh, Let's move on from there. Um, what I'd like to show now is an example. Um, this is an area, uh, <clears throat> the Eagleford is an area I've done a lot of uh, work in. So I've got a lot of um, uh, production data stored in a database that you know, I've looked at from over the years. Um, uh, at this point, you know, we're up to, um, in some cases, almost 10 years of production data to look at. Um, so we've learned a lot about it, uh, most of it in retrospect by looking back at some of that, those early wells that came on stream. And um, I'm going back into non-presentation -pres mode because what I can do is I can grab this data and move it. And what we'll see, there's our unit slope and our early uh, behavior on the type curve. When we match the, the Eagleford data on the type curve, it's a very um, subtle effect, but what you will notice is um, the data is slightly north of our standard unit slope uh, volumetric depletion. And so this would indicate, you know, from my early, from my, from my first slide that we talked about, uh, pressure support, right? And that's what we see with these Eagleford wells. They're, they're almost like they're draining individual bounded systems. Uh, but, and this is a, this is a scatter plot consisting of, of multiple wells. I think there's like 30 or 40 wells plotted on here. And they all have that same sort of shape. They're not quite a unit slope. In fact, if you if you were to um, measure that slope in many of those cases, it's something like between a 1.1 to a 1.4. And uh, some of them approach one, but they never quite get there. There's always that little bit, you know, that little bit of pressure support that you see. Uh, and we even have type curves to, to capture that. And the type curve essentially is very simple. Instead of being a bounded system like this, uh, the type curve allows for some flow uh, on the fracture or into the fracture tips. And we call that compound linear flow. So that compound linear flow gives you this sort of extra boost. And uh, we see that a lot in the Eagleford. We see that a lot in some of the other shale plays as well. So I hope you enjoyed that session. Um, some really simple practical uh, skills that every petroleum engineer should have.
Um, thanks for listening. Uh, visit us at sagawisdom.com for uh, more details. You can see our RTA course in there and subscribe to this YouTube uh, channel uh, and appreciate your support.